So I'd like to begin just by a few words about where we are. We're in the Media Lab at MIT, and this is a place where actually a lot of the fundamental research has occurred uh, <laughs> that, that's brought us to this point. And I want to actually start with a sort of mo uh, a point of disaggregation. The, the Open Documentary Lab is part of an academic program called Comparative Media Studies that's physically housed in this building. We're on the third floor, come up and visit. And even though we do media and are in the media lab, in fact, we're institutionally different. We come out of the arts, humanities, and social sciences, and the media lab comes out of architecture. So we belong to two different faculties, but we're joined together in one building and in one endeavor. Media lab is probably a little more design-centric. We're probably a little more critical, but we do a lot of design, and they do a lot of critical thinking. So we're fairly, there's a lot of reciprocity between the two groups. Anyway, the, you know, the Sutherland was doing his work here and also at Harvard um, with these uh, head-mounted displays. Aspen Movie Map, I, I didn't know this until I started preparing for this talk, but this was sort of a virtual Aspen and you could drive around. All the streets were recorded. You could, you know, kind of move in and out. You could go into buildings. And if you went into buildings, what you would find are documentaries made by Ricky Leacock, documentaries about the inhabitants. So the, the, the buildings were kind of an interface to the documentary. Um, and I'd, I'd love to find that material. I haven't been able to locate it yet. Put that there, Richard Bolt and company, another, another endeavor to kind of interact with space, cave-like environment. Um, and I love the name of Ricky's memoirs, the feeling of being there. Because at the end of the day, if VR is about anything, it's about that feeling. It's about a feeling of being there. And I want to talk about that as a through line today because it's a very long endeavor. Um, so first, to raise the question, um, what's VR? We all know, of course, what VR is, but actually, if you start to look at aggregations of knowledge, you find different things. So, for example, um, this was the, these were the first eight images that popped up when I did a Google image search for virtual reality. And they're kind of intriguing because we recognize some of that as VR, of course, but some of that is pretty fantastic. I mean, it's, it's pretty magical. And it speaks to one of the conditions of VR right now that it is both a tangible thing you can buy or almost can buy if you have whatever it is, 800 bucks or 300 bucks or $15. But it's also being so articulated in the public imaginary as this amazing thing, this world you fall into. The rhetoric is pretty intense. And the visualizations of that rhetoric are also pretty, pretty magical. And there's some dangers there. Uh, there's some dangers there in terms of public perceptions. But when these are the first eight images that pop up, it tells you that you know, this is not like searching for weird images of VR. This is right up front and center. Uh, the, the n-gram viewer is always a great way to track how a word is being used. It's, its deformity, to call it that, is that it's based on the books that Google has digitized. And obviously, a lot of the rhetoric of VR is not in book form. It's, it's in the press. So this is a little bit misleading. But I think it's fairly accurate in terms of the, what appears to be a blast-off point in the, in the mid-1980s. And um, the drop-off, I'm, I'm a little more suspicious about. So one question is, what is it, after all? I mean, we, we tend to think, at least at this conference, it's goggles mostly, everything with headsets. But in fact, you know, there's, there are, there's plenty of rhetoric about Second Life as a site for uh, virtual reality. This is a virtual world, and you can enter it and meet friends and uh, attend conferences, do whatever, even have a VR experience within uh, Second Life. It's a little bit recursive. But in other, in other words, this is a perfectly legitimate way to talk about Second Life, as many, uh, to talk about virtual reality as many people have. The spatialized environment of the cave, uh, most recently iterated, at least in my experience, from the National Film Board's uh, 19, circa 1948, a room where you can stand and your body motions trigger the, the video to sort of respond. Your movement through space is, uh, is guided by your, your body motions. One-on-one -on -one experience, pretty much just like the goggles. Um, again, a, a perfectly legitimate way to think about VR, and historically has been VR. So we're at a moment where these, there are these competing narratives uh, about what VR actually is, even though, as I said, each of us have our own default. And um, for me, the interesting articulations are the ones that have the money behind them, because in a certain way, these define reality in a non-virtual way, uh, unless they're using Bitcoin. And um, in, this is from Goldman Sachs, January. Uh, what's interesting with these is both the kind of hype in the financial sector that's a attended VR, and also the fact that it's very difficult to find numbers that disaggregate 
VR from AR. They're usually packaged together. And that's kind of, again, from a VR perspective, kind of an interesting, uh, kind of an interesting move. Uh, some of the numbers, and this kind of demonstrates the urgency, the push, uh, just uh, if, if, if our experience here at the lab is any indicator, there is a real push, an institutional push. We hear it from folks in the press, we hear it from folks in broadcasting. There's an overt push to try VR, you've got to do VR. And I, I can't help but think that some of that push is coming from the, incredible amount of money that's being pumped into the system right now. Um, yeah, 120 billion by 2020, that's pretty remarkable. Um, the headsets, of course, uh, at the last IDFA, there was, a round there was a round table discussion mostly of makers, and one of the things that came up in the discussion there was like, what's, what's wrong with VR? What's the biggest barrier to VR? And I, I think it was pretty, I don't know, 90% vote that it was the headset, the barrier, the box, the thing that separates you from other people, the, the thing that must be strapped on your head. And as I said last night, of course we do have, we're familiar with a kind of one-on-one -on -one immersion. We've had a lot of years of centuries of experience with the book. Uh, that said, there is something kind of awkward about strapping the device on the head, and, and that shows up again and again as a barrier. And it looks as though there are some remedies on the horizon. This is Samsung's uh, latest entrant. This is probably for AR, not VR, but we'll see what comes next. I want to end this little section with a warning. How many of you know about? daily public broadcasting in Germany from 1935 until the end of the war, 1944. Daily public television broadcasting between up to eight hours a day down to two hours a day, every single day with a one week break between March 1935 and the end of the war. The TV was shown in public television theaters between 40 seats and 400 seats, large screen TV. Um, and what happened is, is, I think, kind of interesting. A lot of, there was a huge buzz about TV. A lot of, you know, the, the Third Reich was very interested to promote this, this German technological triumph, this latest triumph, with RCA technology, by the way. Um, so there was a ton of hype, listings in the newspaper every day, and pretty much what seems to have happened is that people would show up at these TV halls, poke their head in, oh, that's what TV is. Oh, I get it, okay, and leave and never come back again. So despite the huge hype, in fact, because of the huge hype, the hype did not match the reality. And the public was pretty much like, okay, yeah, something new, something interesting, but not for me. So I think there are a number of, one could point to a number of, of historical precedents for that kind of behavior, but it's an important one to keep in mind um, given those Google images I showed at the, at the outset. So, Immersion has been a long-term human obsession, some way of finding oneself in another space. And, and I, I want to just open with this um, citation from the patent for the, for the panorama. Robert Barker patents this thing in 1787. And at first it wasn't called the patent, it was called uh, nature, in a, nature in, a, in a glance. But um, what, what's interesting, there are a couple things interesting about the patent, and this is not the whole patent, obviously. One is he spends an enormous amount of time talking about what's between the viewer and the panorama itself. In other words, that mid-ground, because that's where all the things are that really trick the eye into seeing the panorama as reality. It's not that it's just a, a panorama. Th these were circular panoramas, right? It's that there was a kind of mid-ground full of stuff. Those tend not to be represented. If you go online and look for panoramas, you get the image, you don't get the mid-ground. The patent's all about the mid-ground. And secondly, the patent is about a claim, about an endeavor, about an intent, and that's the stuff that's in red, to make viewers feel as if really on the spot. And I would say that if, if you know, that works today with VR. Um, Callum Cooper and I were going to try to put together a little VR prod installation for this thing. It didn't work out. But it was going to be to sort of use some of these old panoramas and just do the voiceover from these perceptions of people in the, in the 18th century and uh, even, even uh, yeah, 18th century and 19th century because they sound just like today. Um, there's a whole history of these developments. This is the Cineorama, the 1900 World's Fair. And, and essentially what this was was a balloon ride. It appeared to be a balloon ride above Paris. It was built like a panorama, a physical panorama. Um, in fact, that's it in the lower right-hand screen. It was just a building. And in this building, you'd stand in a, a gondola. 
the, the top of the screen was masked by the balloon and the bottom by the, the, the sides of the gondola. A bunch of 70 millimeter projectors were underneath the, the, the gondola, synchronized, hand colored, and gave the illusion of a, of a ride over Paris. Um, a pretty remarkable thing. It didn't last. The heat buildup in the booth was so intense that they burned through every projectionist they could find in, in about three days, so that didn't last. But it was a great idea. Um, the, stereo, the, stereo, uh, the stereograph, the stereoscope, is another, is another, you know, the mass medium of the 19th century. And um, I love this guy on the top, sort of <laughs> probably looking at a stereo of the very place that he is, something we're prone to do with VR as well. The sense of immersion really pops up in the imagination of what television will be. This is from uh, Albert Robida, uh, Le XXe Siècle, 1883. And he has a chapter on this device called the telephonoscope. And the telephonoscope allows you to, I mean, it's, we would maybe read this today through the lens of Skype. But this, I love the language here, the suppression of absence. In other words, presence. Um, the, this sense of immersion and being there of, of Feeding time for the kids back in France. Uh, I guess this guy's in Indochina. Um, cinema is attended by huge, I mean, the Lumiere, of the, the alleged Lumiere effect where people dive under the seats with the train. Well, that little incident lives on for about a good 10 or 12 years in the form of cartoons, usually about class difference, farmers versus the sophisticated urbanites. Um, but nevertheless, this is about a sense of confusing where you, what you're seeing with where you are, the sense, again, of, of being there. Hale's Tours was really the first form of fixed motion picture ex exhibition in the US and Britain. These were train cars mounted on springs, front wall punched out, and a rear, uh, rear view projection put in of going down the tracks. So you'd sit in a train car, and the illusion would be that you're going down the tracks in a train, except there's no front to the train. And the thing would rock back and forth. It had sound effects, banging chains on it, wind in the face, a very compelling illusion of being there especially for folks who didn't have a lot of money to travel. Um, Morton Heilig's um, Sensorama, the seat moved, again, aromas, wind in the face, uh, a whole history of these kind of things. Um, endless variations. I'm just, I, I don't know why they never marketed this as a kind of Donald Duck mask. I mean, why, why Aladdin? <laughs> and Toshiba's wonderful, wonderful 2006 bubble helmet. Echoed happily at a, at a smaller scale <laughs> by our friends at Marshmallow Laser Feast. Um, yeah, so this is a long story. And from this, I just want to sort of pull two lessons. One, actually, these things are older than we think. This is a more detailed search for virtual reality on Ngram. And as you can see, it's not 1980. In fact, if you look a bit more carefully, it's 1915. There's already starting to be a bubble of this term. Now it's used in ways that we wouldn't quite associate with VR today, nevertheless. And second, immersion is great. And, 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 and as I've said, we have a whole history. We have a, a legacy of immersive uh, storytelling forms. But actually playing, playing, being the agent in a narrative, constructing your own narrative and not knowing the outcome is every bit as compelling. And that's something we've learned a lot about by working both with games and with interactive uh, documentary forms in general. But it's an important thing to extend to the world of, uh, of VR, I think. OK, one thing I wanted, one thing I think is really important, and I'm going to do this kind of crudely, so those of you that are really on top of the technology will, will have lots of ifs and buts. But this is kind of grosso modo. I want to distinguish two very different directions in the, in the technologies that we're uh, papering over with VR. Um, so uh, 360 video, which is a uh, pretty fixed asset, comes, harkens right back from the panorama and goes back to a Renaissance notion of man, the center of things, and how the, how the optical system works. It's really a very long tradition there. And then things like laser scan, photogrammetry, 3D capture, a whole bunch of technologies that work in quite different ways, but at the end of the day, what they share is transforming the world into points of data and re-aggregating that data through algorithms. Um, I think Fove says it really well here the, in, in, in a certain way. First generation is 360 with, with head tracking. Second, um, a little more interaction possible. But third, and this is really where the next, I, you know, Noni was talking about next generation stuff last night. And, and for me, the really interesting next gen technology, and it's on the horizon, it's out there, you can buy it, is eye tracking, um, which permits this kind of really 
fine-grained interactivity. Um, now, the way that's being sold is that it's going to take care of all the problems with lag and, and pupil distance. It's going to end nausea. It's going to be great for people that are, who, who have accessibility issues. Eye control is terrific for that, already being deployed in that sector and by the military. Um, great for responsive game mechanics. You can imagine a, a whole new types of game forms, playing with the periphery of, periphery of vision and eye-based, eye pupil-based targeting. But really, this is about data. This is about collecting data. This is about where you watch, where your pupils dilate. Uh, as like, if you think that the data trail you're leaving behind on Google is uh, is interesting right now, this is going to be profound. And um, in a certain sense, this is realized doing the face, but this kind of analysis is starting to be done on the eye. This is really about generating docu documents and, in a certain sense, documentaries of the user. In other words, this is a fairly recursive uh, strategy here. So, whoops, that didn't work, did it? Um, so on one side, we have optics and image. On the other side, we have data, scan, um, video assets versus point clouds uh, and algorithms. Fixed, pretty much a fixed position in the world, a fixed text, the fixed video asset, versus something that's always being constituted, always being generated. Um, something that's ultimately kind of passive, even with trigger points, ultimately kind of passive, versus something that's responsive in its documentation. These are two quite different uh, kettles of fish with very different notions of ethics and aesthetics. Um, and I think it, it behooves us to think more carefully about that as we, as we uh, go through. Narrative theory makes a big difference between, a, a big distinction between showing and telling. Most narratives have components of both. My claim here is that VR is particularly good with the showing part. It can tell, of course, we have voiceover. The enemy is a great example, but showing is where its real power is. And it, again, it, it, showing stories is a kind of interesting, perhaps, way to think about it. Long history of this stuff, I point here to Haddon in the Torres Strait Islands, doing sound recording, uh, film recording at the same time all about being there, in a sense, from an ethnographic perspective. Um, last night I showed this clip of Keaton's existential dilemma, where the world around him keeps changing. I think a lot of VR today, at least in our storytelling techniques, has borrowed heavily from the language of film, and that is not exactly working. Just as film in its day borrowed from theater. And we're at the point now where we're trying to evolve new vocabularies. And just a few tips about where those vocabularies, where those storytelling and Presentational strategies can come from. One is things like amusement parks, a kind of thematized space, uh, the tour, wandering, um, play. These become really important assets uh, in terms of thinking about how one connects things. Architecture is a really terrific uh, thing to, uh, uh, way to think about spatialized storytelling as well. Um, and we have some precedents to go back to, but these are, these are narratives that have been based on space rather than on word, space rather than three-act structure. Spa uh, narratives that unfold through exploration rather than narratives that are pre-cooked and uh, you know, with a tidy little structure. Some of you may know the name Andre Bazin. Anyone who studied film at all probably knows this name from deep in the past of film theory. A very important film theorist, French film theorist. And this myth of total cinema is a really wonderful expression of, Sarah asked, is VR its own medium? And, um, Bazin sort of says, look, there's all these, you know, sound and then color and then 3D and there's all these things being added and added. In fact, what people want is total cinema. And by that reckoning, cinema has not yet been invented. And maybe what we're looking at now is, is, is something in that direction. Um, so we can find inspiration in all these ways. I, I want to add to this, like I think, you know, for me the ultimate VR is the dream world. Like, and we spend a lot of time working with technology and we're now trying to understand how the brain reacts with that technology. We could flip that, I mean not we, but the folks who do this kind of stuff could flip that equation and say, let's start with what's in the brain and see if we can control that and shape our dreams a little more effectively. I have never, I have absolutely visceral dreams and smell Tech, texture, color, the works. Like that's so much better than any media experience I've had. And I'd love to sort of just think, can we flip it from technology to understanding the brain to understanding the brain and programming ourselves a little bit. But, okay, so it's important, the last slide. <laughs> Uh, important to disambiguate the various strands of VR because they do have important aesthetic uh, implications. Um, Interesting to look at new spaces for thinking about how we are going to tell stories. Um, 
Yeah, and I think ethical sensibilities is a crucial thing. Ethics is fundamental to this space. And so with that, thank you. <laughs>